Hello, Internet. We're live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford MLSS seminar series. I'm Karan. We have with us today Dan, Piero, Theodore, and our guest today, Sarah Hooker uh, from Google Brain. Um, so Sarah is a researcher at uh, Google Brain who works on um, reliable explanations for model behavior and um, interpretable uh, machine learning, robustness, a variety of topics. Uh, and today she's going to talk about the Harvard Lottery with us. So just as a reminder, um, she's going to give a talk for half an hour that covers uh, the topic. And then after that, for 30 minutes, we'll have a podcast style discussion where you can ask um, questions in the live chat and we'll get those across to Sarah. Um, you can also continue to ask questions while Sarah's giving her presentation and we'll um, keep track of them and try to get them across to her after her talk is done. Um, so yeah, Sarah, uh, welcome and uh, take it away. We're very happy thank, to have you. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Um, let me just share my screen. Perfect. Um, so it's wonderful to be there. Thank you for the invitation. And today um, I am going to be talking about the hardware lottery. So a little bit about me, as was mentioned, is that my research agenda is training models beyond test set accuracy to fulfill multiple criteria. So things like compactness, uh, robustness, fairness, interpretability. Uh, but today I'm actually going to be talking about the wider context in which academic ideas exist. And I'll be talking about a paper that I wrote a few months ago. Um, and in the 30 minutes I have before we get into the fun discussion is uh, I would like to cover perhaps three things. The one is that uh, there's noise in how we allocate resource to scientific ideas. Um, and then the second is really what type of noise I'd like to talk about and to think about, which is the hardware lottery. Why tooling matters and is in fact dictated a lot of the pace of breakthrough in artificial intelligence research. Um, and then the third is where are we now? How, what is the present state of our research field? And how do we avoid hardware lotteries? And actually I'll leave that uh, perhaps uh, even for us to, to talk about during the discussion itself. Um, but let's start here, which is noise in the marketplace of ideas. So uh, history has already shown that uh, there's imperfect allocation of resources in the pursuit of science. So uh, scientists tend to be prejudiced against certain directions and prefer others for reasons that are independent of the quality of the idea. And uh, in many ways, I, our goal of controlling for these sources of noise is in order to ensure better allocation of resources so we can iterate more quickly in the most promising directions. In complex systems, it's often difficult to model all these variables or foresee all the implications. Um, for example, anti-drug campaigns have often uh, resulted in increased use of drugs, as in this case of uh, marijuana, anti-marijuana campaigns in the 2000s, or um, the Great Plague in Europe, uh, the extermination of both cats and dogs actually led to a surge in the number of rats distributing the disease. Uh, and while in many complex systems we can't model the forms of noise or anticipate all the implications of decisions that we make, a reasonable goal is not to eliminate all this noise, but to spend more time modeling variables which contribute the most to the incorrect allocation of resources. I often talk about this in terms of the decisions that we make every day. So you probably spend less time thinking about whether to bring an umbrella with you when you leave the house than you do thinking about your choice of partner or your choice of job. And so our goal should be to think about what most impacts uh, the direction of research. And uh, in machine learning research, arguably, we spend a lot of time talking about the weather. <laughs> Uh, we spend a disproportionate amount of time talking about certain types of noise that impact our research, such as reproducibility of results um, or the quality of the peer review system. Uh, do we have an uh, adequate way of surfacing uh, ideas that are relevant? But we spend far less time talking about the noise introduced by our tooling. And, uh, a researcher that is engaged in our field typically develops a research idea on a single type of hardware 
and with an optimized software stack for this type of hardware, which means that we rarely uh, have um, the, the feedback loop of how ideas succeed on different types of hardware or leveraging different software. And in fact, uh, the available set of options to us is increasingly narrow. That means that we often treat hardware and software as a sunk cost to work around rather than something fluid that we can shape. Uh, and it means that we abstract away both hardware and software. We treat these as independent choices and independent from the quality of our idea. Uh, we can also see this in how we even document what hardware we use. We rarely talk about the type of hardware or the, the software uh, uh, assumptions that we use when we, when we talk about our ideas and publish our research. Um, and today I'll posit that this is a big mistake. <laughs> and in fact, what I will uh, talk about is how computer science history has in fact told us that this is one of the most dominant forms of noise in dictating uh, both the winners and losers um, of the tooling lottery. Uh, and so to talk about allocation of resources and to think about progress within machine learning, we have to, this, uh, we have to both understand the implications of tooling as well as uh, improve the way that we treat these uh, in conjunction instead of isolation. But to get there, I first have to introduce the hardware lottery. <laughs> So I term the hardware lottery, uh, the phenomena where a research idea wins because it's compatible with downstream available software and hardware, and not because it's superior to alternative research directions. And to understand the hardware lottery, we had to ask two questions. One is how do we arrive at such a silo treatment where the choice of hardware and software is independent um, of our algorithm. But secondly, how strained is this assumption of independence? If it doesn't matter, then it's OK that we don't talk about it. Um, but what have been the implications of this? So to do that, uh, we need to start at the beginning. How do we get to be separate tribes? So early computing had a very narrow functional purpose. Uh, so even the Jakarta Loom, which is often thought about as the first programmable machine, was in fact far from that. Um, you typically, it was so cumbersome to reprogram that it was typically programmed once, rethreaded once, and uh, executed a single uh, program of punch cards. Um, analytical machine, uh, which was uh, one of the first machines designed to tabulate logarithms and trigonometric functions, was not even fabricated within baggage's lifetime because materials with the correct precision did not exist. Um, so electromagnetic technology, which would unlock this, only existed in World War II. Uh, and even the Mark I, uh, which was uh, this enormous uh, calculator, um, the size of a large room. I do like to include the fact there that uh, the architect Norman uh, Gates actually designed the Mark I because IBM wanted something that looked futuristic. So a lot of the lure there is the, the function of an architect. But even uh, this, the Mark I, was very much designed to complete only a single task. And the the commonality here is that in the beginning, the computer was an algorithm. So because of those cost of electronics, as well as a, a lack of a, a cross-purpose software, the idea of, uh, of an algorithm was intertwined with the notion of hardware. And this was out of necessity, but it's important to also uh, note that it's not so different from our own intelligence. So we don't inhabit multiple brains over the course of our lifetime. Um, and in fact, our hardware and algorithm is so intertwined that when we think of a brain, we automatically imagine perhaps like a pink fleshy blob. Um, but this progressively changed, and it changed with the breakthrough in electronic technology, and in particular, um, with uh, starting in the 1960s, a realization um, culminating in Moore's law that by shrinking transistors, engineers would be able to double the amount of uh, transistors that fit on a chip every two years. Uh, so many of us know this uh, as a dramatic decrease in the cost of information, uh, a remarkable decline, and it led to predictable increases in computer and memory every two years. 
Um, how I like to often frame this is an excellent excerpt from The Economist, which uh, puts it in the parallel of if we observe the same amount of efficiency uh, in terms of fuel use in cars. And in fact, if we had done that, we would have seen a car that cost 15,000 decrease the cost of a quarter. Um, by the end of Moore's law. And so we had this phenomenal decrease in what it means to transmit information. Um, but this also made hardware design incredibly risk adverse. Uh, and it, the emphasis shifted to universal processors. Uh, because why experiment when you can lock in predictable profit margins? Um, I think the best analogy for this is if you're looking for treasure and you're on a route that's just been discovered, how do you justify going off route uh, on the justification that maybe there's better treasure around the corner. New designs can easily be eclipsed by predictable increases in efficiency. And so over the period of Moore's law, uh, we see increasingly that there was very little experimentation in hardware design, limited deviations. And in fact, where there was experimentation, uh, it was often short lived. So uh, the thinking machine was a fantastic example of a startup that did very interesting things with hardware, but it depended heavily on Docker funding and quickly went bankrupt after that, uh, that elapsed. Uh, even where we did have interesting hardware implementations, it was often limited to certain high prestige, high visibility domains or very particular domains like weather prediction or financial modeling. And so we had this pendulum swing from specialized to general hardware. Um, and this culminated in not just the, the way in which hardware design was done, but also in which these disciplines um, were treated. <laughs> and in fact, tra training became incredibly siloed for each of these communities. Um, uh, and uh, in many ways, it still is reflected in how we share information today. Machine learning researchers are um, tend to work very much in open source format, perhaps more than other disciplines, and to produce uh, an absurdly high amount of content, uh, in part because our iteration cycle is faster. Whereas hardware, it's a longer time frame, it's a more expensive amount of investment, which leads to a more closed culture. Um, and software, uh, because of the, the breakthroughs in hardware, software has arguably had less reason to also care about its interactions with hardware. Um, there's a, a notion of Parkinson's law where the time available fulfills the constraints. There's also uh, likely a comparable notion for how we've designed software. We've just designed software to fill the existing constraints at any one time. Um, and so researchers, arguably rationally began to treat hardware as a sunk cost to work around and focus on what they could control. The implications, though, um, are really uh, what the meat of this talk is about. Uh, why should we care? Um, and uh, Tolskoy, in his book, Anna Canarina, his, the first sentence is, happy families are all alike. All unhappy families are unhappy in its own way. What Tolskoy is saying is that um, it only, while there are many factors that are required uh, for a family to be happy, like, uh, you know, health and, and wealth and uh, choice of partner, if any one of these goes wrong, then you can be unhappy. Uh, and this has been popularized as the Anna Karadina principle. So a deficiency in any number of factors dooms an endeavor to failure. And in fact, with the hardware lottery, what we've seen is that frequently the uptake of ideas in our community has been dictated by downstream compatibility with the available hardware and software. Um, and to, to motivate that, it's worthwhile considering uh, one of the most uh, arguably important breakthroughs, which is our switch to deep neural networks. And in fact, this whole idea of um, the foundations and the algorithmic foundations of deep neural networks was laid very early on. So even a year after the Dartmouth conference in 1956, I believe, uh, we had a perceptor on hardware. Um, in, uh, by 1989, uh, many of the algorithmic components of deep learning were already in place. So backprop invented once in 1963, again, and then for a final time <laughs> independently in 1988. Uh, convolutions proposed in 1982, combined with backprop in 1989. 
However, deep learning was only accepted as a promising research direction three decades later. So the question becomes why? Uh, and uh, the core reason, arguably, uh, along with the availability of data is that uh, universal processes were poorly suited to deep neural networks. So CPUs incur high memory costs on parallel tasks. Uh, you have the need to save intermediate results and process one instruction at a time. And in particular, CPUs are poorly suited to matrix multipliers that dominate the design of deep neural networks. Uh, quite simply, we couldn't train networks that were deep enough. Um, and the need for hardware that supported parallelism was pointed out in the early 1980s. Uh, so this was uh, both known uh, but not enacted upon because uh, there wasn't the uh, innovation within the hardware space to cater to that type of exploration of options. Um, in fact, in the 1990s, where there was some exploration, it, it was short-lived for the same reasons that thinking machines were short-lived. Uh, and the hardware breakthrough that ultimately uh, led to uh, the success of deep neural networks was a fluke. Um, many inventions have been repurposed for unforeseen circumstances not seen by the inventors. So um, a, a, a good example of this is Edison's uh, a phonograph, which he imagined as being used to record the last words of dying people or be used by teachers. When it was repurposed and used um, for playing music, he thought it was too basic a use case. Um, but here again, we have the re repurposing of an invention. So hardware uh, GPUs were designed with video games in mind. And in fact, they iterated for several decades with the, with the video game market in mind. And in the 2000s, it actually took considerable software effort and gradual experimentation to repurpose them for the design, for the, for the design of training deep neural networks. But critically, they were very good at paralyzing matrix multiplies. And GPUs combined with better distribution allowed for the breakthrough in 2012. Um, and this breakthrough uh, it was not trivial because uh, it resulted in dramatic gains in efficiency on how do we train deep neural networks. And uh, critically, the, it allowed for um, training deeper networks because better distribution and a higher amount of flops turn out to be key. So a good example of this gain in efficiency is the difference between two papers on the same topic, classifying cats. Uh, one is a very famous paper from Google, which used 16,000 CPU cores, and that came out in 2012. And a mere year later, we have a replication um, of this task, which only used two CPU cores and four GPUs. Um, uh, where there's a loser of the lottery, there's a winner. And so from the 1950s to the 1990s, uh, the winner was symbolic approaches and expert systems. So in the gap between this algorithmic breakthrough and the empirical support, expert systems dominated. And expert systems um, require that you verbalize the expertise. Um, and there's clear limitations. I often think this is best communicated by a video that my colleague made. Um, and he videoed himself uh, both codifying all the actions required to open a bag of dates um, and the difficulty of codifying that because so much of our, our action and how we navigate the world is reflex or well, we don't know how to articulate it, we just do it. Um, and so while symbolic approaches were heavily used in things which where a knowledge is heavily documented like healthcare, um, there was a sharp cliff in how they could be applied more generally. Um, but cr critically, uh, software favored these symbolic systems. So a lot of early software work uh, was much better suited to the type of if-else statements and logic statements that were used heavily um, in expert systems and symbolic approaches. We had the dominance of Prolog and Lisp, and in fact, uh, students who were in the area of machine learning were expected to master these languages. And only in the 1990s, 2000s, we see a healthier ecosystem for frameworks like MATLAB, Lush, Theano, um, which has emerged, of course, into the systems that we know today, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, 
um, and uh, thinking about the flexibility that those give us and implementing some of the algorithmic uh, choices that we have today. So in 2012, the empirical success of deep neural networks was so resounding that most of the field arguably switched overnight. And the last decade has been dominated by research on deep neural networks. Um, and uh, it's important to, to grasp how, how short modern computer science history is. Um, and in particular, I think about this a lot when I think about this next section, which is the persistence of the hardware lottery. Uh, today, there's a pendulum swing back towards specialized hardware. And this is driven by a few different reasons, by the end of Moore's law, by spiraling energy costs of training uh, models, and by widespread commercial use cases of deep neural networks. Um, so if in the first part we articulate that the siloing of these disciplines has led to hardware lotteries, what happens when these uh, disciplines come closer together? Does this end the hardware lottery? Um, and uh, to talk about this, let's also acknowledge that much of the impetus for um, uh, specialized hardware and co-design around specialized hardware is because uh, we have an appetite for more parameters. So we have a bigger is better race in the number of monoparameters that has gripped the field of machine learning. Um, so there's a shift from task agnostic hardware like CPUs to domain specialized hardware that tailor the design to make certain tasks more efficient. And in particular, if you think of GPUs as the breakthrough that was better suited to matrix multiply, most domain specialized hardware that's been released since has just has been more, further optimizing for uh, processing of operations like that, but also perhaps for things like sparsity or thinking about how we train more efficiently. Um, this does make training of deep neural networks far more efficient. However, it arguably also makes it far more costly to stray off the beaten path of research ideas. Um, because specialized hardware is realistically designed to prioritize on delivering on existing commercial use cases. It's taking ideas from research which are widely recognized to be successful, um, and it is using that to deliver um, more efficiently to the real world and resource constraints. While built-in flexibility to accommodate the next generation of research ideas remains a distant secondary consideration. And this is understandable because designing new hardware takes time. And uh, it's typically two to three years to develop a new generation of hardware. And it takes between 30 and $80 million. And so it's, uh, it is difficult to imagine making a bet without being able to guarantee that whatever you design the hardware for has longevity of use case. However, there's already early examples that I ideas which do things differently that don't fit this paradigm of a single forward pass, single backward pass, um, and a connectionist network um, fall off a cliff in terms of performance because they don't fit our current hardware um, and software paradigm. And one of these examples is Capsule Networks. So Capsule Networks is a paper um, by Sarah Sabor, uh, Nick Frost, Jeffrey Hinton that proposed that some things which uh, about deep, about particularly convolutional neural networks, uh, we should do differently, that there were some properties lacking. Uh, and in fact, this is this perhaps is not a discussion about uh, capsule, ne uh, capsule networks and the merits of the idea, but rather it's a discussion of what happens when an architecture does something that's different, um, that requires a different type of operation. And capsule networks in particular had this squashing operation um, that deviated from our standard backward forward pass. And performance on capsule networks fell off a cliff. And so incredibly difficult to train. I really recommend for anyone curious reading this excellent paper describing these difficulties, machine learning systems are stuck in a rut. Um, and while capsule networks are one example, uh, there's a question of what are the failures that, what are, that we still don't have the hardware to see as successes. So uh, because we uh, are increasingly using a narrow set of hardware, which is very specialized for a certain subset of ideas, um, how will we know uh, when we have a promising idea but doesn't empirically show itself to be successful? 
And the risk you attach to this and to, to the state then really depends on how heavily you want to bet on deep neural networks. And I, I heavily me recommend uh, reading both these blog posts that came out in 2019 who sit on perhaps different ends of the spectrum. So um, I, I would characterize the bitter lesson as saying that the recipe of more compute um, and more data uh, is with a with an, uh, a a framework which learns a representation dependently is the way, um, and Maxwelling more cautiously saying, well, we need better, we need priors, and in, in many cases, uh, we can't just depend on uh, re delegating the representation entirely to the model, um, and this comes down to perhaps my viewpoint, which is a question of what is realistic in this regime the, of our popular recipe of adding more parameters and data to solve tasks. Uh, are we in a regime that's sustainable? Um, or is this akin to building a ladder to the moon? And there's several assumptions about deep neural networks that are arguably primitive. We initialize at random. Uh, we do a forward and backward pass for every example. All examples are treated equally, um, despite differences in the capacity costs and a representation. A lot of my recent research has been showing that a lot of our capacity is used to learn a small subset of examples. Um, and so if we're spending many of these weights learning a small subset, is there a way that we could do this better? Um, in comparison, our brain is incredibly energy efficient. We have specialized pathways, so different modalities uh, uh, activate different circuits in our brain. We simulate a lot of what we see. So if we already, re if we already recognize something with high certainty, we don't do a full forward pass, we just simulate out. Um, and unless I do something very noticeable right now, like put my hand up here, you're probably largely simulating um, what you see. Um, that we also have large scale, log scale vision, which means that it takes a noticeable change for us to register. And all these factors mean that uh, we are incredibly energy efficient in how we, uh, how we input energy, uh, how we extract what examples we wanna pay attention to. And I only say this as a counterpoint, that it's possible that deep neural networks are the, not the only way of extracting a useful representation of the world. And it's possible that the next breakthrough will require a fundamentally different way of modeling the world with a different combination of hardware, software, and algorithm. Um, and I want to uh, say as a final thought before we go into discussion is that any attempt to avoid hardware lotteries has to be concerned with making it cheaper to explore different hardware software algorithm com combinations. I mentioned before that it's rational right now for researchers to abstract away hardware and software. Um, by that I mean it's too expensive for researchers to care. <laughs> uh, it has to be easier for me to be able to deploy uh, algorithm to multiple types of hardware. It has to be easier for me to have auditing tools for understanding the implications of the software that I choose and profiling for the algorithms that I use. Right now it isn't. So while there are some isolated efforts to improve this, for the large part, a uh, researcher is still stuck in the paradigm of this is my sunk cost of hardware software, and I'm going to um, I'm going to create my sandbox so I abstract away the impact of those. Um, and so that's something to think about. Uh, the final takeaways I have is that computer science history is very short, so <laughs> we are painfully early uh, in how we explore many of these ideas, and that perhaps uh, means it's more relevant for us to understand what have been the main blockers in progress and stickiness of ideas over others. Um, and that specialization is really uh, prioritizing uh, commercial use cases and established ideas. So we need to think more widely about how we support ideas that um, are essentially not, uh, not increasing the cost uh, of straying off the path. In many ways, specialized hardware is making the winners richer and the losers poorer. So what do we do to address this? Um, and uh, I did mention already the way forward, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But let me pause there and uh, let me uh, perhaps uh, open up for the discussion part. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, that was a really great talk. and. I think uh, all of us probably have a lot of questions and I'm sure folks in the audience do as well. Um, 
So yeah, just as a reminder to everybody who's uh, watching, feel free to put questions in the live chat and we'll try to get them across. Um, yeah, so I guess just to kick us off a little bit, I um, so when you were talking about the hardware lottery, I was thinking a little bit about, um, I guess, um, the sense of a lottery in other areas of the stack, right? Like, so hardware, there's also maybe some notion of a software lottery, right? Where like certain programming languages or uh, even frameworks within languages are like preferred because of convenience and because of widespread ad adoption. Uh, but it seems like, as you pointed out, like the cost of swapping that out maybe is a little bit uh, lower. So you can have TensorFlow and PyTorch coexisting and somebody can come along and build Jax. Um, and, and those things are relatively uh, lower investment, right? Whereas in hardware, uh, like, as you said, cost tens of millions of dollars to uh, even make uh, a shift. So I'm wondering if, the, if this is almost something that's like an unavoidable thing where, where it's really impossible for us to figure out a alternate path because it's just so expensive for somebody to build a new type of specialized hardware to test out, let's say, a, a new idea, right? So let's say capsule nets. Um, like, how is it even possible for somebody to build hardware to support that um, in, a, in, yeah. in a short time frame? This is a very fun question, because this almost gets back to the question of what types of risk do we pay attention to? And for example, as humans, uh, the threat of a nuclear disaster, we rarely pay attention to, even though it is a threat, because in terms of what is controllable about it, it doesn't make sense for us to pay attention to. So perhaps what you're asking is, is this even a type of risk which it makes sense to pay attention to because we don't, maybe it's not within our realm of control. So uh, despite the name of this paper being the hardware lottery, I do talk about both. I think it's very intertwined. And I think one aspect of it is that we don't pay attention to it because we don't know the degree to which it impacts our ideas. So there, software absolutely has to play a very bigger role. Like when I deploy to a type of hardware, I want better profiling and higher level API profiling as a researcher for what is, what is the impact of my hardware on parts of my algorithm? What is very inefficient? The second thing is that software actually has a bigger role to play in different ways. So it's not touched upon as much in this paper, but software in terms of how it's been structured has also been heavily fit to a forward backward pass. Like if we think about local signals or uh, weight swapping between networks, which I, ideas I'm very interested in, it's actually very cumbersome to program. That being said, uh, the reason why software has to play a bigger role is that by surfacing feedback loops about how hardware is incompatible, uh, researchers become more articulate in what they want as design specs. So whenever I go to a hardware uh, conference, the last one being uh, back in the days when we were in person, I went, uh, Pete Warden kindly invited me to um, the uh, ML at the Edge. And I was speaking to all the um, hardware designers there. And frankly, their first question was, what do you need? <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting because I think it's a, um, uh, it's a chicken and the egg until researchers have feedback loop about what is currently going wrong. Because it's almost as if right now we deploy and uh, that's it. <laughs> we don't really get a sense of what could be better. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, so I guess, um, would you say then that um, a productive place for us to start is to uh, maybe expose better interfaces into the underlying hardware so that researchers have a better idea of what's going on? Um, and like, for example, I, I actually studied electrical engineering in my undergrad, so I have at least uh, some understanding of what goes on. But I, I suppose like if somebody comes from maybe non-traditional background, they, they, uh, they have to think more carefully about like, uh, you know, like what's actually happening underneath and how does that relate to the algorithm? So uh, do you have Absolutely. thoughts? Absolutely. And I would say, um, I would say you're perhaps being too generous. I would say even if you come from a traditional background, right now researchers <laughs> don't, uh, we, we deploy and we focus, uh, we treat as a sunk cost. And that's also why researchers are so um, uh, reluctant to let go of their favorite stacks, right? Because we found something that works for our idea. And then it's very hard to get researchers to try something new. Whereas if there were quicker feedback loops about what works and what doesn't, would uh, be less reluctant to let go. Um, and uh, maybe I'll pause that, but there is a fun example of this uh, that I can share if we have more time. Sarah, I, as you kind of like described some of these, uh, you know, processes and um, uh, things like the, the sunk cost. I wonder what we can learn from 
uh, computing fields in the past that have kind of played this dance before and um, done uh, kind of developed specialized hardware for their own fields. Um, the one that comes immediately to mind is kind of graphics where, uh, you know, over a couple of decades, they developed the hardware and the software um, kind of in, in lockstep. Um, do you have any thoughts on like how we might be able to uh, introduce that same kind of, uh, you know, cross, cross pollination between the hardware and ML side or hardware and software sides of machine learning? So hardware is very interesting because hardware requires an appetite for risk. And right now, the way that we've treated this is uh, there hasn't been a large bet on hardware uh, from uh, the aspect of government investing um, as there has been in other ways. And I, I frankly think it's underserved. So companies have one role to play, uh, but so does wider national policy. And the type of longevity that is required to explore the hardware space is either motivated by a fluke, like you develop it for a commercial market and it ends up working for something else, or it requires the appetite to say this is of national interest. Because typically some of the most interesting scientific breakthroughs have happened because frankly, it was of national interest. So I'm not an American, but I do look on with interest at all the implications that the American space race had on many fields of science. And I think it's a great example of when you make something a value-driven uh, pursuit, uh, you, end up w uh, having more stamina for risky research, which may or may not pay off. And that's critical when it comes to hardware, because frankly, the, the interesting aspect about hardware is the payoff is huge, but the problems are enormous. Not only are you dealing with how do we work with new materials, perhaps, um, how do we use our existing materials under more and more uh, stressful constraints, um, but uh, the amount of capital needed to iterate is, uh, is a world of difference from the amount of time uh, and effort needed to iterate in the machine learning space. Right. I, I wonder as a, as a kind of follow up to that. Um, uh, so kind of, kind of thinking about the development of the GPU in, in the graphic space where, um, you know, that they also had similar, uh, you know, risk um, reward uh, calculations, but somehow they, they like, you know, in graphics, they managed to, um, uh, to, to get the incentives aligned. Uh, what, what do you think kind of the, the equivalent would be for machine learning here that would kind of encourage people to look at those risks? Um, uh, you know, obviously creating a giant gaming industry is one of them. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there is an aspect to your question, which is um, perhaps uh, underserved or perhaps I haven't given enough credit, which is that, so graphics really was, the, the feedback function was commercial use case. So in that way, it was lucky. You had a clear market and that's what propelled a lot of the development. Arguably, now we have co-design, which is focused on specialized hardware. And it is good to have people from these different disciplines in the same room again, even if it is for specialized hardware, because sometimes having common language. So right now, for example, if I say, uh, something uh, like accuracy, it, it means different things to uh, 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 a machine learning research than it does to a hardware design. So even getting people in the same room can also have unexpected externalities. So in that sense, I do agree that a commercial use case can motivate uh, interesting explorations of the space and can also calibrate common vocabulary so that these disciplines can talk to each other better. Um, so that would be one example of, of uh, perhaps even if specialized may in the short term increase the cost of strain, there may be unexpected benefits. Yeah, you know, making me think, Sarah, about like, you know, a, a, a trade-off between exploration and exploitation where we are like the hardware is so expensive to do and that's the reason why you companies try to go towards route of maximum ex exploitation rather than exploration right does it make sense is there a way to frame the problem and so what could be ways to increase and uh, push for a little bit more exploration yeah i completely agree great way of putting it i'm actually you know just as a follow-up on a point that we touched upon previously um, on software, um, I'm actually very curious of how do you see that as um, so the way I see it, and you tell me if it makes sense to you, is um, I believe that maybe in 2011 or 2012, if it wasn't for um, the existence of 
something like piano or, or the original torch in Lua, even if there was the hardware that supported the computation that would have been needed for deep neural networks, I don't think that there were so many people capable of writing CUDA code that would have enabled um, so widespread adoption of deep learning models. So I'm curious what you think about software as a tool for uh, allowing more people to get into exploiting a specific hardware piece. Yeah, absolutely. You've hit on something which uh, what didn't come through enough in the presentation, which is that so all of the 2000s were a, a series of really purposeful efforts to create software to exploit GPUs. So the 2012 paper was uh, only, we often think about it as the Alex Smith, the breakthrough, but in fact, multiple papers appeared in 2002, 2006, 2009, which was showing, hey, if you uh, work on the software and, and you train on GPUs, this is going to increase your efficiency uh, by a considerable amount. So it was not overnight. In fact, uh, to your point, I think a lot of what what we see as a hardware breakthrough was in fact also a software breakthrough. It was building out uh, the tools to allow uh, for more easy deployment, and it wasn't a trivial task. Yeah. Um. Sarah, I have a question. Uh, listening to your talk, um, you mentioned that you know the hardware engineers really want to know what the ML community wants. Um, but that's a pretty big ask because when we build a model, we often don't know why exactly it works. And we do you know, empirical results that you know, proof by example. Um, so it sounds like in order for us to know what we want, we need a stronger theory um, to kind of understand and, and then explore you know, within that theory uh, so, you know, as weird as it sounds in a, at a system seminar, um, it sounds like, you know, one of the potential answers to this hardware lottery would be just being able to better understand why the models work. What do you think about that? I almost feel like a easier stepping stone, uh, which uh, I think maybe because I'm a, a grumpy researcher, I prefer to know where my current models fail. So I think I want to know when I... I personally want to be able to deploy to multiple types of hardware easily. So even uh, I'm spoiled, I'm at Google, even if I want to launch for multiple types of hardware, it's actually cumbersome for me right now. I have to often rewrite my code if I want to switch from TPUs to GPUs. Um, things like that make it hard for me to get feedback loops about are there performance differences, but I actually want to go further. I want to know what's taking up time in my training on different types of hardware. Because knowing where that fails, I feel like it's the first step in me having a more um, a grounded, anchored opinion when someone asks me, what would you like to see? Um, and there, I think that is an easier ask than tackling this big question of what models will work in the future. Uh, starting with just having a way to measure. There's a fantastic quote, I feel like, um, uh, it's by Carl Pearson, maybe, but it's the quote is, uh, what we measure, we make progress on, which is very true, particularly if it's a concrete uh, way of just articulating what we're grumpy about and what we want to see improved. That's, that's excellent. I think, you know, it's the other side of the same coin, right? We, we can't explain why it works, but we can see what doesn't work and then build from there. Uh, Sarah, I wanted to highlight a couple of questions um, that we're getting in the YouTube chat um, about uh, programmable hardware and kind of uh, more flexible hardware designs. Um, so Sanjeev Kumar has a couple of questions about um, uh, what, uh, what your thoughts on our programmable hardware like FPGAs um, and whether, uh, uh, you know, something like that would be a solution to this uh, hardware lottery problem. Yeah, so I actually, um, I left th those slides out because I wanted to see where the discussion would go, but um, I definitely think in the medium term, that's a really exciting research direction, this whole idea that we can reprogram uh, hardware to suit different tasks. Um, so the tricky thing is it's still quite painful <laughs> uh, to, to, to work with reprogrammable hardware. And I suspect that's a hurdle for uh, hardware um, designers to cross, but I definitely think it's, it's in the medium term, given how little wiggle room we have in hardware space, it's by far one of the most promising directions. Um, there's also uh, perhaps uh, more far out directions uh, when we talk about hardware design, but uh, those are perhaps more long-term. Uh, 
Right. Uh, one of the things that I uh, that I remember from the very little hardware that I know from classes is that uh, the the more options that you uh, and control pads that you built into hardware, usually every time you add in more control pads, uh, that you pay a cost and efficiency. Um, so those uh, you know technical um, things. Uh, could, yeah. You know, yeah, that's a good point. The other point is, is that often uh, software ends up being the bottleneck. So often uh, you end up designing um, a type of hardware, which is reconfigurable, but uh, creating the compiler code and uh, the software code on top of it, you end up spending an enormous amount of time doing that. Um, so the, that's also the cost. So as we have a more heterogeneous hardware landscape, software actually faces a bigger task, which is how to be portable um, and how to be portable and still maintain efficiency. So there's some interesting work, I would say, coupled with this idea of reconfigurable hardware, which is uh, portable software. So can we uh, leverage um, even algorithmic approaches to try and understand how we generate software that works for different types of hardware? Sarah, can I ask you a little bit of a controversial question? Yes, please do. <laughs> what is your take on um, proprietary hardware and how it impacts directions of research in practice, right? So the whole idea of proprietary hardware is not new. So it, it is really a symptom of uh, how hardware is developed and the cost of iteration. So researchers, we often talk about being scooped. Our cost of being scooped is actually painfully low compared to the idea of our hardware uh, being scooped. So I think it's not isolated. I suspect you said uh, uh, controversial because I work at Google. I don't think Google is in, is any is unique in its approach to this. I think, in fact, there's very few efforts beyond some at academic labs to do open source hardware design. Um, there is some. Uh, efforts to fund and support open source hardware design. But the critical, uh, the critical hurdle remains the cost. When you have high cost to entry, it becomes, um, it becomes more difficult uh, to say, well, we will do this in the open. Um, what to do about that? So I think that one aspect of this is that to some degree, the surge in startups that are doing hardware, the, the surge in very different types of hardware will lead to uh, will lead to interesting ways and in sharing of information in different ways. But I do think that this is almost a facet of how funding is done. If we want to have more open source discussions about this, frankly, we need um, to have Funding come from multiple different sources and support come from multiple sources. Um, so th that's where I would leave it. What I will say is that the, this is not unique to this point in history and it's not unique to one company. The whole uh, culture around hardware design is frankly entirely different from the culture around machine learning research. I showed that chart of uh, the amount of papers that we publish. The amount of papers published in hardware design has remained constant. <laughs> It's kind of incredible. So it has not increased at all over the last few decades. Yeah. I guess there's a different model like there, I guess. Yeah, completely different. So I, I wanted to ask your thoughts on just generally, um, I guess, stepping back the process of innovation and, and how kind of um, new discoveries are made. I think like over the last couple of centuries, like I think kind of the uh, maybe the working model for the set of people who uh, do breakthroughs has shifted from the, let's say like individuals and kind of that trope of the like mad scientist to maybe like groups that work together efficiently right to uh, do breakthroughs and these can be like global uh, coordinated efforts. Um, so I'm wondering like in this kind of um, hardware lottery uh, um, framing like have you thought about whether there's a um, an ideal or or a possible process of innovation, you touched upon funding a little bit that you think might be better suited to these types of synergies between like software, hardware, and um, and generally the overall goal. Like in machine learning, I guess the broad goal, if you had to kind of state in one line is to build like models that are basically as capable as humans right now at various different tasks. Um, so I guess if that was like the overarching goal, like what would you think about in terms of just like allocating funding, who the people should be that are involved and, and how would you kind of orchestrate that 
system. Oh, I like this. This is like giving me a budget and being like, what would you do with this enormous budget? So um, perhaps some thoughts. There's no answer here, but what you're talking about with the increase in team size is really this industrialization of science, right? So we've had, and this is not just in terms of team size, but increasingly we have specialization of researchers, we have specialization of labs, we have um, certain reputations that are supposed to be compactly described in a few words. And you think of that embedding space when you think of that person. Uh, in general, I would say that this is because of how we have done funding. <laughs> so back in the day, there was a notion of a gentleman scientist, um, both because most scientists at the time were men, but also because uh, it was often a gentleman pursuit. So you would do it either with your own income or you would be given income by a wealthy friend. Uh, and in many ways, it was no questions asked. Just go explore and do your gentleman pursuit. And I actually, um, so as there's a romantic notion for me when I think about the idea of a gentleman scientist because it speaks to this ability to cross-pollinate ideas, whereas with specialization, we lose some of that. We essentially are saying that what we believe is for certain problems, we have bigger time sizes and we exploit a single direction. And this can be good. And in fact, in some areas, this can be critical, but it's often critical once a discovery is being made. So once a discovery has been made, uh, it unlocks a new door and then we want to quickly exploit all the secondary implications of that discovery. It's less clear that this is a model that works for the initial discovery. And in fact, uh, when we think about core breakthroughs, so the Alex Knight paper is fascinating because <laughs> um, I think it was in large part, the work getting the software working was because um, one of the researchers involved just really loved software engineering and wanted to do that. So it wasn't as if, this have been like a, a the core focus of the lab uh, and uh, Jeffrey Hinton's lab at the time. It was more like this one student uh, was single-mindedly, adamantly pursuing this idea of can I get this to work on GPUs? And often a good dose of that is critical for breakthroughs as well. So what I would say is what dismays me about the current funding model is this emphasis that uh, we have we 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 slight researchers who generalize. And particularly what's been found is that if early in your career you generalize and you touch multiple disciplines and you bridge ideas, those are the researchers who early on suffer in terms of the overall amount of citations, but in the long run are the successful researchers. So they're the ones who are most capable of seeing the connection. And most breakthrough, like most art, is repurposing existing ideas and concepts in new ways that other people can't see. So that rarely happens with a team. <laughs> like if I had written the hardware lottery with a team, it would read very differently, frankly. <laughs> and many of my papers are written with teams and that's also fantastic for many different reasons. But um, it's an exploitative stage, going back to Piera's description of uh, when you exploit and when you explore. Um, teams are better for exploiting existing uh, breakthroughs. Uh, so as we kind of uh, get come near the, the end of the hour, um, I wanted to ask you one more kind of higher level question as well. Uh, so I really like the examples that you gave in the beginning of your talk about unexpected consequences in complex systems, like uh, the, the effects of the anti-drug campaigns or, or of the animal control campaigns during the plague. Um, besides some of these hardware selection effects that uh, we've, we've kind of seen um, from our, uh, that, that you kind of talked about um, today, uh, what do you think about, uh, uh, have you, thought about what are some of the kind of broader societal effects that our ML systems are having um, on kind of like, you know, broad society today, especially as these systems start coming online um, and uh, really start to, to uh, do, uh, you know, resulting in like value um, at, at scale uh, for, for the first time in, uh, in, in decades. Oh, this is a broader question. This feels like the budget question, so <laughs> the entire landscape. Um, I mean, it's a, a very valid question. A lot of my research is on this topic. So most of my research agenda is how do we train models just beyond test set performance? How do we generalize models in the real world and make sure that what we expect of behavior of models is actually the behavior that we expect? 
Um, you, so I, I think that while we are in a very exciting stage where we can use algorithms in new ways and resource constrained environments and in all these different um, tasks, um, it's both uh, incredibly exciting to be working on technology which has a huge impact as well as uh, really exciting from a research perspective, because we're doing all this research on how do we actually generalize beyond, you know, so much of machine learning can be described under the paradigm of empirical risk minimization. It's our belief that if we pool a training set um, and then we uh, and then we pull a test set. The average performance on that test set will be indicative of what we can expect everywhere else. And increasingly, what we're seeing is that it's not a, it's not a, a stellar gold star proxy for what we expect. So it's also forcing us to think more about how do we train algorithms. One of the slides, and perhaps you can gather some of what I, I think more widely about the type of algorithms that we use, but one of the slides that I talked about was my recent research showing that most of the capacity that we use is for just a small subset of examples. And why is that interesting? Because if most of our capacity is used for a small size of examples, then would we do better by treating these examples differently, by identifying them early in training and restructuring how we train itself? Because right now we seem to be using the crudest tool to learn these examples. We just throw a ton of parameters at them. So there's interesting directions of this as well. Because we've delegated representation to the model, we often see the way that we can uh, impact the model as this recipe of parameters and data. But perhaps what we need to think is revisiting the representation itself and the priors that we 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 have when we train a model. Um, so uh, to put differently, uh, there are many exciting challenges in, in machine learning research right now. And what makes them exciting and why my work is kind of at the intersection of theory, but also work that has direct implications is because I enjoy seeing the connections. Like I like when I work on something and then I understand that um, it is improving efficiency in resource constrained environments. Um, yeah, I guess since we have three or four minutes, I, I just want to ask you maybe uh, a meta question about how you, uh, I think all of us were uh, very impressed by the presentation, of course, and there are so many questions. I mean, um, I'm, I'm just curious how you pick research directions and how you um, kind of decided to write that uh, paper, as you said, uh, alone on the Harvard Lottery and, and so on, um, and, and just like how you um, generally view uh, machine learning in, in, in this area. Wow, so you gave me all that for three minutes. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. We, ha um, we, have to, we have to ask you a question you can't answer. So. <laughs> That, that's wonderful. I mean, I think I'll, I'll perhaps I'll talk about the last one, which is uh, how did I pick the hardware lottery? So a lot of why I picked the hardware lottery is was that I was asking how um, I just worked on this paper, which is the state of sparsity. I worked with my colleagues Trevor Gale and Eric Elson on it, and there we benchmarked many different uh, sparsity methods, and we covered a breadth of different domains, and. I remember asking to myself at the end of the project, well, if I went from 70% sparsity to 85% sparsity, how would that, what would the, be the equivalent improvement in performance on hardware? And I didn't have to answer that question, but what was surprising was when I talked to, I, I started chatting to different people about this and no one else knew either. And I think that was when I realized that there's a broader disconnect between how we think about our algorithms and even something which is very much motivated. So my interest in efficiency comes uh, from my desire to make machine learning more accessible. And I grew up in Africa. So many of the communities I grew up in are very resource constrained. So even, even though that particular thread of work is very motivated by, I wanna see uh, how this translates, um, the dialogue and the terminology we have to discuss how that translates is actually very decoupled. Um, so that's why I started asking more broadly, how do we get to this place? <laughs> how do we get to this place where we all talk differently about the same thing, um, but we all use different metrics? Um, and that 
perhaps there's a broader arc in my research. I enjoy bridging ideas. Like a lot of these uh, I, these subfields like robustness and fairness and compression have been treated independently. And in fact, there's entire subfields to each. But when you train a parametric model, you're inevitably, your constraint for one preference is ine inevitably uh, causing trade-offs with others. So treating all these, uh, so these des uh, desirable properties as siloed uh, is, in some ways primitive. Uh, when we think about what we want as a model, if it's private, for example, differentially private, we compromise some other aspect, like we compromise long tail treatment of underrepresented features, which can have fairness implications. So um, that is probably, uh, if it sounds very odd to say a research signature, but I think <laughs> a lot of my research has been driven by this um, sense of uh, grumpiness. Like, why don't we talk about this in a more nuanced way? And if we talk about it in a more nuanced way, what do we learn from it? Awesome. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed the talk and, and we hope you had a fun time as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody who tuned in. Um, today, uh, go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu and sign up to our mailing list. We'll have talks every week um, and subscribe to the channel. We hit 3000 subscribers. I think I tweeted that out yesterday. So thank you so much for watching. And uh, um, next week we'll have Fabio Petroni joining us. Um, thanks everyone. See you. Uh, and thanks, Sarah.